So when we have these battles between warm and cold air, what can happen? Well, you could get a cold front. A cold front occurs when you have cold air advancing and it moves under warm air. Now, why would it move under warm air? This has to do with density. Cold air is denser than warm air. And whatever is less dense is what's going to rise. Whatever is more dense is going to sink. So you have this cold air advancing on this warm air pocket, and that ends up causing the warm air to rapidly rise upwards. See, and that's what we're trying to show here. It's rapidly rising above that cold air. And remember the rule. When warm air rises, it can no longer hold the water in it. And when we talk about the water in the air, that's humidity. Right? So the more humid an air mass is, the more water it's holding. So if we have this warm, humid air mass get pushed upwards, as it rises upwards in the atmosphere, it expands and it cools down. It can't hold all that water anymore, and so we get stormy weather. And where we have the cold air advancing on the warm air, it's usually a very, very sudden boundary, which means that warm air is forced to rise really, really quickly, and so this can create severe weather. This is what usually happens to create um, uh, thunderstorms and then downpouring rains and in fact sometimes even supercells and tornadoes. Now that's a, a, a that one there that was our cold front right the advancing cold air. Now a warm front is where we have warm air that's advancing on cold air and since it's warmer, it rises over the pocket of cold air. And that's what we're seeing right here. We have this cold air here, we have this warm air here, and as it's advancing on the cold air, it does start rising. But if you notice in this diagram, it doesn't rise as quickly or as suddenly. It's not as sharp a boundary as with the cold front. And so with the warm front, we usually get a wider area of precipitation, and in many cases, it's not that severe weather. It's not going to be the big thunderstorms and tornadoes. This is more going to be those rainy days that you sometimes have, right, where it's not severe weather, it's just rainy. And that's often from this warm front advancing. You can also get stationary fronts where uh, neither air mass is strong enough to push against the other, so they just kind of run into each other and sit around there, and this can create also these long rainy days and cloudy weather in places. Ooh, and I just mentioned clouds. Let's talk a little bit about clouds. Clouds consist of tiny particles of water or ice in the atmosphere. And whether they're little droplets of water or little specks of ice depends just how high you are in the atmosphere. And these form where warm air rises. Right? The clouds are basically that humidity coming out of the warm air as it cools. And you can have this happening because of something called convective lifting. This is what occurs here in summertime. Right here in southeast Texas, we have those really, really hot summer days and this really humid air. Well, there's going to be these places where the air gets just a little warmer than the air around it, and it rises upwards and makes these, these kind of pop-up thunderstorms and pop-up little clouds. That's our convective lifting. You can also have frontal lifting, which is what we were just talking about, where you have, you know, the warm front or the cold front forcing your warm air upwards. Or you can have orographic lifting. This is related to mountains. You can have air masses hit a mountain, 
and while the air can't go through the mountain, it has to rise over it, and as it rises over it, it can create clouds. This is why oftentimes when you drive uh, towards the mountains, you will see clouds above the mountains. Now, precipitation occurs when these tiny little particles of water or ice coalesce together. That means they like hit each other and stick together. And eventually, enough of them hit each other and stick together that they grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and then air currents can't heat, keep them suspended in the atmosphere anymore, and they start falling out of the atmosphere. They're too heavy. And that's when we get our precipitation, our rain or our snow or hail or sleet or whatever it happens to be. Now, there are different types of clouds that exist. And in fact, if you really, really love clouds, you can look up the Cloud Appreciation Society. It really does exist. Google them. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, when we look at clouds, now just to let you know, this is the Cliffs Notes version. I actually have a book on clouds that's like this thick, just on different types of clouds that exist. So obviously we're not going to go over all those different clouds. That's for a meteorology class. Um, but classification of clouds. First thing we look at is the shape of those clouds. We call them cumulus clouds if they're poofy. Stratus clouds if they're flat or cirrus clouds if they're kind of wispy. Now we also look at the height. So if they're what's called mid-level, meaning two to seven kilometers high, we call that, we, we add the prefix alto. So we might say, oh, there's some alto cumulus clouds. Or if they're really high, greater than seven kilometers, we say cirro. So you might say cirro cumulus clouds if they're puffy clouds really, really high in the sky. And then the last thing is if they're rain producing. If they're rain producing, you add the prefix nimbo or the suffix nimbus. Like cumulonimbus means a poofy cloud that produces rain. And here's a nice little diagram showing some of these. There's our cumulonimbus puffy rain producing cloud. Uh, here's just some typical cumulus clouds. There's alto cumulus, there's alto stratus, and so on. So there's a number of different kinds of clouds that we can get, and these all depend on do we have high pressure or low pressure or a warm front or a cold front or convective lifting or things like that. All right, let's finish off uh, by looking at something called El Nino, because lots of people hear about El Nino, but don't necessarily understand exactly what's going on in El Nino. Now, El Nino is um, basically one of these ocean oscillations. It's the most famous of the ocean oscillations because it really affects, um, in some cases, temperature, but especially precipitation globally. Even though this is something that happens in the equatorial Pacific, that means the Pacific Ocean around the equator, even though it happens there, this can have global impacts on uh, weather and, and climate. Oh no, C-3PO fell. Blue's not doing her job. Let's get him back here. Uh, okay. So what happens in a normal system off the west coast of South America? So we're talking west coast of South America, Pacific Ocean. In normal circumstances, you have these trade winds. These are nice constant winds push the surface water westwards. So it pushes surface water away. The surface water is warm. If the warm water gets pushed away, this allows cold water to basically rise up and take its place. We call that upwelling. So we get this upwelling of this deep, cold, nutrient-rich water. And this makes like fishing in that area really, really good because the fish thrive on those nutrients that are brought up out of the deep ocean. But what happens in an El Nino is that the trade winds become weaker. So they no longer push that warm surface water away. So 
in the coastal waters of South America, instead of having cold water, we get warm water. And this ends up um, not being so good for the fish there, because now those nutrients aren't there. And the, the first people to document this happening were some of the um, uh, colonists, the uh, Spanish colonists who were there, and they noticed this also happened usually around Christmas time. So they named the event El Nino, the child, in reference to oh, it's Christmas, in reference to the Christ child, and that's how it got its name. Today we call it the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Now there is also something called La Nina that can happen, and that's when the trade winds get extra strong, and so they really push that warm water away and make for like extra cold water in the coastal areas of, uh, uh, of South America. And so depending on where this cold water is and where this warm water is can have, like I said, global impacts on the climate system. Now let's look at these in, uh, in a graph or a, a diagram. Here's our normal, what usually happens. There's our trade winds, push all this warm water over here towards Australia, so we have cool water there. That means Australia gets plenty of precipitation, it's kind of normal there. In El Nino, the trade winds aren't pushing that warm water there anymore, so the warm water hangs out here, cold water is over here, and this means that Australia gets a drought. We get some more rain over in this area. Now in La Nina, where you get the extra strong trade winds, it stays colder over here, they get extra warm water over here, they actually get flooding and stuff because they get extra rain over in that area. And so that's what's happening if you ever hear when you're watching the Weather Channel or Weather Nation or something like that. Um, shout out to the Weather Nation guys, you do a great job. But anyway, um, if you ever watch that and you see them talking about like uh, El Nino, La Nina, or things like that, or Enso, El Nino Southern Oscillation, this is what we're talking about. And this is why it can affect precipitation patterns around the uh, different parts of the planet because of where the warm and cold water goes. And that brings me to the random picture of the day. Um, you know, we talked about how Earth's uh, North Pole is tilted towards the sun, right? Well, this is uh, close to the northernmost point in Europe, this is Repvig in Norway. Uh, and you can see this is 12.30 a.m., this is just after midnight um, in, uh, in July, and it's light out. And that's because when you get that far north, and uh, because the pole is pointed towards the sun in summer, the sun never sets. You can like watch the sun come down towards the horizon and then it just goes back up. Of course, this means that come winter time, the sun never rises and we have the Merkatiden. We get the dark times. <laughs>